So today, we've been uh, throughout this year, because I had a lot of them, I, I wasn't intentionally dragging it out, but I had asked at the first of the year if you have any questions about different uh, subjects or topics in the Bible, and I received 42 different responses, and so I've been kind of working through those, and we find ourselves in the month uh, of July, this month, is probably, at least for me, it is the, the toughest of all because of some of the subject matter uh, that we have been and will be addressing. And some of those include, last Sunday we talked about sin and temptation. We talked about our sin nature uh, in general terms. Then there were numerous questions about sexual sin and then self-inflicted problems, generational curses, suicide, drugs, and alcohol abuse. So it's very uh, sensitive, if you will, on the subject matter for this month. The one today I find especially um, uh, just praying about it, uh, being kept awake at night thinking about it, and so on, because it's on the subject of sex and sexual sin. I got quite a few questions about this on things such as um, uh, many of them, at least, at least 10 of them, adultery, lust, pornography, homosexuality, uh, transgender, and so on. So I've got all of these questions here today answering the question, what does the Bible say about? So I want to talk about these things today, but before we do, it kind of helps to get our mind in the right place because uh, everything that you will hear today, if we're going to see what the Bible says about it, then I promise you it's going to be unpopular and it's going to be countercultural, okay? And quite honestly, it's even trying to be uh, legislated as hate speech. So what we need to do is decide if we are going to listen to what God has to say on these subjects that many of you asked about, or do we come in and go out and maybe even get a little offended because it didn't mesh with our preconceived ideas, right? In Matthew chapter 13, there is a passage where Jesus is talking about the parable of the, the seeds, the sower, and the soil. And in this parable, he says, and it's not our, our text today or anything, but he talks about the seed that is planted, and the seed is the Word of God. Okay? The seed is the Word of God. The soil is the heart of the hearer. Now, he lists four different types of soil, but for brevity today, the two extremes. The one extreme is the seed that was given, but it fell by the wayside, and it was just trampled on, it was useless. That's the person that can come in, hear the Word, reject the Word, get offended by the Word, and leave mad, angry, I'm not going back there, on and on and on, okay? That's seed that fell by the wayside. The opposite extreme is that that says what the Bible, what Jesus says is fertile soil. That is soil that hears the word. It may be tough to hear it, but we recognize as tough as it is to hear this, it is the very word of God. It's not man's opinion. This is God that is speaking to us through his word. It may be tough, but it's his word. Amen. Therefore, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to address it. I'm going to make course correction in my life, if necessary, to conform to God's Word. That is the fertile soil, and it says that you will receive blessing and fruit in your life in abundance for those that have fertile soil. So where's your heart today? Are you on the one side that says, I can already tell I'm not going to like this? Or are you on the other side that says... Let's see what God has to say about it. And I'm prepared to adjust my life as necessary. Who wants to hear what God has to say today? Amen. Okay, are we there? Amen. Okay. I promise that as we talk about this, it may be hard, but we want to do so with as much love and compassion as possible. 
because uh, we just serve a great God who wants the greatest blessing for all of us. So with that in mind, and we've agreed together that we want to hear what the Lord has to say, we're going to pray over this. And then after we do, it's going to be important for you to have some things to make notes on, because I've got about six Sundays worth of Scripture to share with you today in about 20 minutes, all right? And I'm going to do that just because... Uh, you can get the research, you can study it, we can talk later if we need to, uh, or I can get you some resources and so forth, but uh, uh, it's just a lot to take in here in a short amount of time, so be sure and write these down. We'll turn to a few of them, but not all. So let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that we live in a country where we can share the truth of your word. Regardless if it is popular in our world or not, we can stand here without fear of uh, government intervention or censorship to share what thus says the Lord. Lord, you know how you've burdened my heart uh, with this uh, particular subject to speak the truth in love, to speak it with compassion, but also, Lord, not to shy away and to speak it with conviction, knowing that when we follow your plan, We receive the greatest blessing, joy, lasting fulfillment in our lives. And so for all of us, Lord, I know that that, uh, these types of sins affect all of us in some form or fashion. So help us be the good soil ready to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. So what does the Bible say about sex and about sexual sin? If you have your Bibles, go with me to a couple or one passage first, Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. I've had you turn to this particular passage, this now for the third time in uh, recent months. And in this one, it's because Jesus is being questioned on the subject of divorce. Now, we're not talking divorce today, but what he does, these men that are questioning him are the religious people that are questioning Jesus about divorce. Their reason for divorce, I mean, I'm sure they had many, but one of their reasons was to satisfy their own sexual immorality. They were had a wife for a while, they got bored, you know, and and many in that time, she was considered uh, just about property. And so they would get rid of her so they could move on to someone else so they can spark some life into it again, if you will. So they're questioning Jesus about this, and he answers, because what we're going to see, we first need to start with a foundation of God's perfect plan for sex. And, and, and he's going to give that to us in this particular passage. It is unpopular today. It is counter-cultural today. However, we're going to see in several passages that God's plan has always been the same since the creation of the world. That sex is to be enjoyed within the marriage covenant between one man and one woman for a lifetime. Unpopular but true. Marriage covenant. One man, one woman for a lifetime. Jesus speaking on this subject in Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse number 4. He answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. He takes these men that were trying to trick him, trying to trap him, and trying to justify their own sinful behavior. He takes them not only back to Mosaic law, which they would have known very well because of their position in society, but he takes them all the way back to the beginning, at the creation, where he says, have you not read, guys, you should know this, have you not read that in the beginning God made them male and female? And then he talks about the marriage covenant where he says a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and they become one flesh. And what God has joined together, let no man separate. So in God's eyes, when you enter into that covenant of marriage, you become one flesh. Not just 
physically, but spiritually, mentally, emotionally, you become one, inseparable in the eyes of God. And it is in that perfect union that God has designed and given the gift of sex. I've been going through a book study with uh, several uh, guys in the church, The Resolution for Men. And it talks about the relationship with a husband and a wife, and it talks about also uh, sexual immorality that creeps in and destroys marriage relationships. And it talks about how it makes it seem, from a worldly standpoint, so attractive to chase after that other than which God has designed and perfectly protected. It makes this statement, I liked it, so I wanted to share it with you. Because sometimes people chase after sexual immorality because they feel bored or that one partner for life is too limiting. But it says this in the resolution. By confining confining it to marriage, God is not limiting the enjoyment of sex. He's actually protecting it, keeping it pure and holy and special. Sex is, in fact, God's priceless wedding gift to a husband and wife to join, to enjoy after they covenant together in marriage. And and simply, too many people try chasing after movies or adulterous affairs, uh, pornography. We'll talk about that in a moment because it's affecting so many of our homes and our, our lives. But none of that brings the level of intimacy or passion or romance or lifelong commitment that God originally designed sex to be. It is all perversions of what God has. Satan is glad to pervert sexual purity and replace it with other things that do not ultimately satisfy. And so that's the topic today. Once we understand that God's perfect plan, no matter how unpopular it is, is the covenant of marriage. One man, one woman for life. I mean, you say that today on social media and you are blasting out hate speech, right? That's why I said we've got to come and see what God says. But let's look at some of these areas that you've asked questions about where Satan has perverted and replaced sexual purity with things that will not last and not bring the happiness or fulfillment that we seek. If you have your Bibles, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll talk first. I had several questions about adultery, uh, fornication. So we'll talk about those in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Chapter 6, chapter 7 is where the Apostle Paul is addressing uh, sexual conduct and the marriage relationship. So he addresses fornication, which is sex between two unmarried people. He also addresses adultery, which is sex between Uh, someone who is married with someone other than their spouse. He says this in verse number 13 of 1 Corinthians 6. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your members, that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not, Paul says. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her for, and here he goes, quoting again back from Genesis, the same thing that Jesus quoted, for the two, he says, God, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined with the Lord is one spirit with him. And then he goes on to say, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. 
Let's talk about the devastation of both adultery and both fornication in the life of individuals. It's trying to seek the intimacy and the romance and the passion and the lifelong commitment, but you just can't find it in those relationships. Picture, if you will, the covenant of marriage is like the big fire pit. And it's nice having the fire in the fire pit. You can get up close to it. You can get warm by it. You can roast marshmallows and make s'mores when the fire is in the fire pit. But then when it gets out of the fire pit, it becomes dangerous. When it gets over into the brush and catches fire. When it gets out of control because it's out of its confined space. Sex is within the confined space of the covenant marriage, but often it gets outside that and and we chase it hoping to find all the benefits that can only be found, as God's Word tells us, right there in the protective space of the marriage covenant. Paul said, every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. What he's saying in this, because there are other sins that affect us physically. Drunkenness, alcohol abuse, uh, gluttony, those types of things affect us physically. But there's something even deeper with sexual immorality or sexual sin because it affects us spiritually It affects us mentally with images or thoughts or scenarios that you can't erase. It affects us on the soul level and our relationship with God. And it does affect us physically as well. So Paul says to run from it. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 32 and 33 says, "...whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding." He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. When we get sex outside of marriage, it comes with one of the, uh, the wounds and the dishonor and the reproach, the shame, the regret that doesn't ever seem to go away. It seems to plague our mind and our lives for weeks, months, and even years. See, it doesn't stay true to the promise. This is fun. This is exciting. This is no big deal. Everybody's doing this. But then you find that it comes at a great cost. Hebrews 13.4 says that sex outside of marriage will invoke the judgment of God. Marriage is honorable among all things and the bed undefiled. Marriage is honorable. The bed is undefiled, pure, holy, no shame, no regret, pure intimacy between two people that have covenanted together before God, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. That's tough to hear, but that's the truth of Scripture that we must recognize if these particular issues are part of our own lives. So that is uh, the subject of adultery and just a few things that the Bible says about it. And these tied together because if you would, we want to talk a little bit about lust and pornography because I had a couple of questions about that. So go with me to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is speaking. He's given instruction on spiritual matters and on practical life application. And in this, he says in verse number 27 of Matthew 5. Okay, I'll just give you a second to get there. Because I want you to see it for yourself and make notes uh, also. In this, Jesus is going to quote one of the Ten Commandments about you shall not commit adultery. But look, he says this in verse 27. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. All right, so he quoted it. Uh, But now he takes it a step further. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than the whole body be cast into hell. 
If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. Jesus says you shall not commit adultery. And then he takes it a step further when he says, But I say to you that if you look after a person to lust after them in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Because see, it begins in our mind where we look and then we begin to uh, play that scenario in our mind. And so on the mental level, and Jesus says on the spiritual level, in your heart, we've committed adultery. That's the power of lust that Jesus is talking about, that to lust after someone is to already violate one of those Ten Commandments that, he said, has been spoken of from old. Lust is... Obviously, the driving factor in the pornography industry, which because of time and because of sheer volume, I cannot share with you all the sad statistics about how many lives pornography is ruining, not just worldwide, but even in our own country. There is a particular ministry website called Covenant Eyes. Some of you may know about it. Uh, If not, you probably ought to look at it. And you can see it talks in detail about statistics on the pornography pornography issue in our lives and how it even affects people in the church. And and I, I couldn't even believe how many people it affects. And this is just the ones that admitted to it, even in ministry or areas like that. It is devastating. It is enslaving our lives, and when it is allowed to run rampant and unchecked and never under control and never submitted under the mighty hand of God where you can break free from it, it causes people or leads them to do horrific things. It is devastating, as Paul said, You sin against your own body on the spiritual level, on the mental level, on the physical level. As I read through Covenant Eyes this past week, I read how addictive pornography is because it quickly begins to generate new pathways in the brain. And the brain begins to feel a rush of dopamine which brings excitement and pleasure. But then the mind becomes overwhelmed. The brain becomes overwhelmed with the rush of dopamine. So it begins to shut down dopamine production. But then the person is left wanting to try and get that feeling that they had before. So it forces them further and further and further because what's satisfied today does not satisfy tomorrow. And that does not satisfy the next day. And it drives you further and further on. So much so that it even affects our bodies physically and it listed so many different side effects health-wise and physical-wise because people continue to feed lust and feed pornography hoping to find some satisfaction that can only come when we keep the relationship as God originally intended. It has an effect on our relationships too because what we have to do if you're involved in uh, pornography, it takes a toll on your relationships because you have to hide your activity. Now you have to be looking over your shoulder. You have to have passwords that nobody else knows. If you're ever questioned about it, you get defensive. You don't need to be on my computer, my phone, that's mine emails, all the rest, and it forces us to become emotionally detached relationship-wise. And of course, that is not going to bring God's blessing or health or healing in our closest relationships. It will affect our marriages, it will affect our children and uh, their uh, their lives and, and their children's lives if we allow these things to go unsurrendered to the Lord. We see Jesus says, Paul said it, Jesus says it, that we've got to put up safeguards. 
measures, boundaries in our life. We talked about this last week when I talked on the subject of temptation. Put up boundaries in your life so that you're not even tempted in those areas. Sometimes it takes, uh, it takes us getting radical to do so. That's why Jesus says. I mean, look at this. What did Jesus tell us to do in verse number 29 and verse 30? He said, if your eye is causing you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. All right, now is there anybody that would agree that's kind of radical? I mean, if I'm struggling with lust or pornography, gouge out my eye and throw it across the room. Right? If your hand is causing you to sin, cut it off. Man, get me the saw, you know? Man. But what is he saying? Take drastic measures because the damage is that real. Take the drastic measures. Because everybody likes to think, you know what? I can handle it. Everybody, nobody's perfect. Everybody sins. This is just my little sin. It's no big deal. Hmm. Satan loves it when we have that approach to sin in our lives. That's why Jesus says, Take drastic measures. Paul said, flee, run from it, the opposite direction. Job made a covenant. This is where Covenant Eyes comes from, the, the ministry website. Job 31.1, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? He decided in his life he was going to live with sexual purity. He made that covenant, and then he would take the radical measures to make sure. Too many times I've suggested when I have talked to someone in counseling about uh, some sexual sin in their lives, and it usually revolves around pornography, and I suggest some radical action in order to avoid that temptation such as getting rid of a smartphone or a tablet, getting rid of a computer. In the movie Fireproof, uh, he, he suffered. Some of you may have seen that. Kirk Cameron, his character, suffered from, uh, was uh, addicted to pornography. And he took his computer outside and took a baseball bat to it, you know. And when you suggest these things, people just look at you like you're crazy. Well, I, I can't do without my smartphone. I, I can't do without my iPad. I can't do without my movie channels. You can if you're serious enough about breaking free from the addiction and going on to the life of blessing that God desires for each one of us. Right. Yeah. Adultery, pornography, here's a big one. And I had the most cards on this one. Homosexuality. Homosexuality. Hate speech if you speak against it by our worldly standards. But we decide, I've decided, many of you have decided that we believe this is God's holy word. And it is for us and for our lives. And in this, I want to share with you one of those passages of Scripture that speaks to this subject. It's over in Romans chapter 1. So if you would, go there. You're in 1 Corinthians 6. Turn over to Romans 1 real fast. I'll show you a couple of things on this subject. Now, you're going to hold your place there, but before uh, I read that one, we'll go back, Brody, because I'm going to read uh, Psalm 139. Because there are, and, and I, I've had, I've had um, friends that were homosexual, and I, they would just, I would ask, uh, just ask about it, and several times I received the answer that uh, I was born this way. And so there was a verse that comes to mind in Psalm 139. In addition to what Jesus said, and in addition uh, about in the beginning... He created them male and female. And in addition to what Paul said when he iterated the same passages, 
The psalmist says this, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. Look at that in 14. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. All right? Marvelous are your works, and my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they were written, the days fashioned for me as yet there were none of them. Make note in verse 14. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. Jesus said in the beginning, I made them male and female. He makes them fearfully. He makes them wonderfully. Marvelous are His works. And God does not make mistakes. Do you believe that? God does not make mistakes. To the King, immortal and visible, to Him be all glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. That we read about from 1 Timothy earlier. That omniscient, all-powerful God is the same one that created each one of us. And He created us fearfully and wonderfully. It says He created us for His pleasure and to bring Him honor and to bring Him glory and to love Him. He did not create us to live out a life of sin that Scripture says He hates. That separates the relationship. It doesn't draw us closer. And Jesus Christ died so that we can have that close relationship for all eternity. So then what are we left with? Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We see that mankind, we, all of us, make a choice. Not just on the subject of sexual sin, but anything in our life that's contrary to God's Word. Verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who, and you ought to underline this, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That means I can see what God's Word says, but I want to do my own thing. And so I'm going to ignore this, shut this down, disregard this. Because I want to do what I want to do. All of it, all of this sexual sin that we talk about is, a form, it is idolatry. It's about consuming our lust, our self-gratification, everything uh, about what we want. And because of time, I, can't, I won't read it for you, but 19, 20, 21, he's talking about this idolatry. I want to skip down to verse number 24. Because of time, it says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Because of their idolatry and because they suppressed the truth and, and they made that choice, they refused to submit to God, it says that God gave them up. He says, all right, go do what you want to do. You'll experience the, the damage. You'll experience the repercussions. But there you go. And it goes on to say in verse 25, "...who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creation, uh, creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever." Sometimes that creature we serve most of the time is us. And I want to do what I want to do. It continues on in verse 26. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And verse 28, 
And even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which were not fitting. And then he begins to list this snowball effect of sin that is in a person's life. But it shows us in that passage. And there are others like it, both Old Testament and New Testament, in Corinthians and Genesis and Exodus and so on that talk about the choice that we make in these areas of life. But it was not God's original design in the beginning, and it is not ancient or outdated. It is still true today because God's Word does not change. So what is our response? Let me share, with, share this with you quickly as we close. First of all, if you're going to stand on the Bible and the biblical view of marriage, expect to be persecuted. 2 Timothy chapter 2, ver, uh, chapter 1, verse, uh, I'm sorry, 3.12 says that all who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. So we just have to expect that that comes with the territory when we st- take a stand for Christ. We're also to pray for one another. There is no amount of counseling, badgering, coercing, uh, any of that that will work. We must pray for one another because it is only God that can convict the heart, turn them from their sin, and set them at liberty or freedom from that sin. And so James chapter 5, verse 16 tells us to pray for one another so that we may be healed. Another response that we should have as Christians, because we will be labeled as haters, and there may be some that think, because I've spoken on this subject today, that I hate people that are involved in these things, and I do not hate people. I do not hate them. We hate the sin in a person's life, but we do not hate the person, and we are to pray for them, and we are to choose love over judgment. What's so great about the Bible is it tells us time and time and time again to leave the judgment to God. After everything that he said in in Romans chapter 1, going from verse 18 to verse 32 about all the sin and everything that goes with it, then he gets into the first two or three verses of chapter 2, and he says, here's the paraphrase, don't judge anybody. Don't judge anybody. The same things that you're judging someone else, you're doing those same things. Leave the judgment to God who is going to judge in truth. That's what Romans chapter 2 says, right after. So we don't judge. Choose love instead because 1 Peter 4, 8 says, above all these things have a fervent love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sin. What this world needs, what we need is to love people. And we talk about that all the time as a church. People need compassion. People need someone that cares. And that's what the church should be about. And as often as we can, we do all the good we can trying to be a blessing to others out of love for them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15 says, See that no one renders evil for evil, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and others. Regardless of what people say to us, we continue to help be a blessing to them, pointing them to a God that loves and cares for them. I close by saying if you're involved and sexual sin, and you're wondering, how do we escape? Is there any hope? Does God hate me? Am I going to receive His curse forever? I'll close with three verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul's talking to the church and he says, none of these people will inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says in verse number 11, and such were some of you. He's talking to the church. He's saying you were in one of those categories and such were some of you. But... You were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 
you're washed clean, you're sanctified, set apart, you're justified, declared not guilty because you surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ and to His Spirit. So if you are looking for that way of escape, this is it, to acknowledge the seriousness of the sin and how it affects your relationship with God and your relationship with others. 